Esteban's attack was totally out of circumstances. It was exactly what we didn't want to see and we're gonna draw the consequences. We're going to make a tough decision. These are the translated from French to English words of Bruno Fama, Alpine team principal just after Ocon and Gasly came together at the Monaco Grand Prix, resulting in the end of Esteban's race after a very, very aggressive lunge, let alone on your teammate. The damage to his car ended his race. Fortunately for Pierre, he was able to carry on, managed to P10 finish Alpine's first point of the season, but it was almost nil poor. Well, the reaction has been big, weirdly big, actually so much so that apparently Alpine are seriously considering benching Ocon for Canada and sticking in one of their Alpine Academy junior driver reserves. Crazy. My name's Tomo. Let's talk about it. As Martin Brundle said on comms, you don't lunge your teammate into turn eight, Portier at Monaco on the first lap. Like Gasly's fighting with the Williams in front of him, of Alex Albon. Esteban just launches it up the inside. He gets alongside, fair, but he doesn't give Gasly any room on exit. If you're gonna go for that overtake, you need to give the driver on the outside space. When they're your teammate, for crying out loud, man, on, on lap one. And ironically, it was all for nothing because the red flag was literally about to stop the race. If this incident had happened 10 seconds later, then they'd have both been fine. But the red flag took a little bit too long to come out, actually, if you ask me. I don't see why there was such a delay. A red flag straight away would have stopped this incident from ever even happening. I get it, Monaco is a track where you need to capitalize lap one. I understand that fundamentally, but you're racing as part of a team. And Gasly is going for a move. He's trying to put pressure on Albon early doors. What are you doing, Esteban? This is just foolishness, man. All right, if it's not your teammate, I get it more so, for sure, right? You're going for this overtake. You're trying to get into the points. He's on the cusp of the points. I get it. But on your teammate, and they clearly discussed this prior to the race because that's the first thing Gasly said, and that's one of the first things Bruno Faman said as well. They obviously discussed this eventuality, and Esteban thought, Okay, I'm doing it anyway. Daniel Ricciardo had a prime view of it all happening in front of him as well. He was reminded of his run-ins with Max in 2018. There was all-to-all -all touching, I feel like, three times before that happened. Honestly, it reminded me of Baku 2018, where Max and I, we touched, I think, twice or three times before the accident. I could see it happening where I was like, okay, I feel like tension is rising very quickly, and sometimes with teammate, it sparks even more. I know how that one goes, and I'm sure they, the team, are not happy. All for nothing, five place grid drop for the next race, which I do think that's weird because usually they're very generous with lap one shenanigans, right? I don't understand why Ocon got a penalty for that when we've had just as if not more egregious incidents resulting in no penalty, you know, pushing people off the track turn one. Like, they were wheel to wheel, he didn't give a Gasly quite enough space. It was a big outcome. Ocon suffered for it more than Gasly in the end which I'm, I'm glad for because Pierre didn't deserve to have his race ruined. Look, we see teammates trip over each other all the time. We see people have lap one incidents all the time. And Ocon's been very good this season. He's consistently outqualified Gasly. He's consistently finished higher than Gasly in the races. The fact that Bruno Faman is considering benching him, like apparently, according to media sources, there is genuine consideration. The decision hasn't been made that, but there is genuine consideration to bench him. Tells me that there's way more to this than just you know, this incident in isolation. Because look, we know the relationship between these two has history, okay? My most successful YouTube video, in fact, is talking all about uh, why Esteban and Pierre historically have not gotten along. And even when they're announced as teammates, you know, they were like, we're not gonna be best friends, okay? Even though they essentially grew up together, used to spend a lot of time at each other's houses growing up and competing in, in junior formulas, both being from Normandy in France. It's a real shame that relationship broke up and I'm sure it's for reasons that, you know, we will never know. There was a lot of, I'm gonna call it cope from Otmar Safnauer when Oscar Piastri decided, you know what, I'm off to McLaren, mate, and then you're bringing Gasly alongside Ocon. I'm happy that our driver pairing with Esteban and Pierre is better than it would have been if we would have won that case the case being the case against Oscar Piastri, the, the contract case. More experience, still young, and time will tell, but I think faster. I mean, Oscar's had an unreal weekend in Monaco. I get that Otmar's got to try and do a PR job here, but Oscar's delivering for sure, and these two, Gasly and Ocon, 
it just doesn't work, does it? But of course, Ocon's been at that team since 2020 and it has been linked with a move away. I mean, Mercedes was yeah, always going to potentially be an option because he still managed, which is weird in itself, by Gwen Legru and and Mercedes, even though he's French at a French team, he's not actually as embedded in terms of kind of management as, as Gasly is. Even a Haas move, right, which is somewhat a damning indictment of where Alpine are, but Haas are the quicker car, the better package at the moment. Who knows from 2026 onwards, can you rely on Alpine, on Renault developing a good enough engine from 26? The engine always seems to be the, the deficit. You go back to the Red Bull Vettel days and it was that Renault engine that kind of let them down when they went into 2014. Yeah, Alpine have enough to worry about with the car itself. The chassis seems to be sound, you know, the weight penalty isn't as significant in Monaco and Pierre was doing a very good job. He was like P5, I think, in, in Q2. He was very quick over a lap around Monaco. The Williams were quick as well with Alex Albon getting to Q3, even though that car is overweight. So from a chassis point of view, from an aero point of view, Alpine are not in a terrible place, but their car is just carrying a few more kilos than it should be, like me. Minton, you really want to get down, don't you? Look at him, he's like on the edge. In the position they're in, you would expect the drivers to be the more reliable part of the equation, right? Given the years of experience both have had, but shenanigans like this, Alpine don't need that. And the only reason I can think of Alpine seriously considering benching him, because that's huge. And what, for one incident? Seems like a massive overreaction. But if Ocon is looking away, is looking out the door, and Alpine think they've got a driver on their hands, a young Alpine Academy driver who is going to be the heir to Ocon's throne if he is to leave, giving him a run out now, using this as an opportunity to oh, kind of discipline Ocon, I guess, maybe that's the way they see it, but also give this young driver a shot in this current car around a track like Canada, alongside Pierre Gasly, it kind of does somewhat make sense. Look, Oscar Piastri has been doing bits for McLaren. There is no question that he has very much close that gap to Lando Norris and them two, they're super young, they're in a great position. Zach Brown has really finessed it, getting Oscar Piastri in for sure. He's delivered on that potential he was showing by winning back-to-back -back Formula Renault and then F3 and then F2. Like, he's the real deal. They fumbled him for the potential to keep Alonso. They ended up fumbling both of them. Historic L. So Alpine will want to be making sure they don't make the same mistake again with the next driver that they believe could be the heir to a, an F1 seat throw because their academy is actually pretty stacked. Nicolas Solov and Gabriel Mini both won the sprint and the feature race in F2 this weekend around Monaco. In fact, Mini leads the entire championship as well. So he's prime positioned to take the dub. In F2, they've got Kushmayani and Victor Martin. Obviously, Victor's had a bit of a difficult start to this year. Very good season in F2 last year. F3 champion the year before that. And Kushmayani, especially over a lap, he's been super consistent. The amount of top 10 qualifying finishes for Kush. Good start to the season this year as well. These last couple of weekends he's struggled. But they've got Alpine got two very, very talented drivers in Kush and Victor. Look at Abby pulling in F1 Academy, right? She's Seems to be the only opportunity for a proper title fight alongside Dorian Peen as well. I think Peen was seen to be the one who's going to walk it, but Abby's actually stepped up and given a really good account of herself. And that, I feel like, is going to go down to the line this year. However, the leading name in that academy, someone who does look like they are being primed by Renault Alpine to be ready for a seat, be that a reserve or a full-time seat, of course, is the son of multiple-time motorbike world champion Mick Doohan, another Aussie, Jack Doohan. Does benching Ocon and sticking Jack Doohan in for a race help tie him down, tie him to that team, right? Because they'd be giving him plenty of test mileage. And I think when you look at Jack's career, his CV isn't quite as impressive as Oscar's, but then who's his realistically, right? Oscar was one of a kind, a Leclerc, a Verstappen, the actual insane levels of dominance, even Kimi Antonelli right right now. Like, Jack wasn't that, but still very good. Doom was comfortably second in the 21 F3 Championship behind Dennis Hauger. Got a P6 overall in his rookie F2 season. Pretty good, right? Three wins to his name. In fact, Spa was unreal, because he actually got P2 in the sprint as well. P2 in sprint and P1 in the feature. Banger. And yes, he was P6, but he was only 36 points behind P2 Tao Porsche, that was the year that Felipe Drogovic absolutely ran away with it. Now, 2023 was much more promising, and 
It took a while to get going and it's very much a season of kind of what could have been. For the first five weekends, he really did struggle to deliver points. It was a P2 in the Jeddah feature race that was the highlight by all means. Otherwise, he was very much struggling, scrimping points here and there. He managed 28 points after the first five weekends, which would have been the first 10 rounds. However, from weekend six in Catalonia to weekend 14 in Abu Dhabi, those eight weekends, Jack outscored everyone by a bit of a margin and all. 140 points over those eight weekends, that's averaging nine points per race. And bear in mind, a sprint gives only 10 for a race win, 25 for a feature win. For context, in those eight weekends, championship winner Tao Porsche scored 119 points and P2, Frederick Vesti, scored just 108. Whatever Jack found in that kind of second two thirds of the season, if only he found that at the start, he'd have been right up there. And as for 2024, this year, he elected not to participate in F2 for a third season, which at the time, I do remember kind of being a bit cynical about that decision, questioning it somewhat. Surely seat time is better than no seat time. But then again, he has clearly gone all in on his reserve drivers at Alpine. He's there every weekend. He's been doing a bunch of testing mileage as well, which we'll get into. He's been doing media for F1 as well. He's putting his face out there, which I do actually think is a very calculated decision by Jack to try and put his presence front of mind. Not being funny, not just for Alpine either, but any other team that might be interested. Oscar proved a year on the sidelines doesn't have to destroy your momentum because you can still achieve a lot in a reserve role. And I think Jack seeing that, seeing how well Oscar started his F1 career last year and being like, you know what? I can give you what you missed out with the other Aussie. Oscar Piastri conducted around 3,500 kilometers of testing in a 2021 Alpine whilst he was on the sidelines in 2022. For context, the minimum length of a Grand Prix, excluding Monaco, is 305 kilometers. So that equals out to over 11 full Grand Prix's worth of testing that Piastri had done before he even stepped foot in a McLaren. Now Oscar's showing his ability, showing how good he is. Well, first of all, Alpine will have that historic data. They still own that data from those 3,500 kilometers of testing that Oscar did. They can use that, they can benchmark that against Jack. As for Jack, well, last year he did two FP1 sessions in and Abu Dhabi and managed 108 laps of Yas Marina in the postseason Abu Dhabi test. That's about 570 kilometers of running. As for this year, he's already done his first proper test, a two-day test at Zanville in their TPC testing previous cars. Terrible name, by the way, for that program. Of course, it's in Alpine's best interest to get their reserve driver, Jack Doohan, as prepared as possible for a potential substitution, right? Be that, you know, Ollie replacing Carlos, be that Liam Lawson replacing Daniel Ricciardo last year. But also, with all that testing he's already done and a busy year's program ahead, which indicates there's going to be a lot more mileage for Jack Doohan, I'm sure he'll do at least one FP1 as well. By that point, with all of the time that Jack's had behind the wheel, they should have a really good idea as a benchmark relative to Oscar, a benchmark relative to Esteban and Pierre as well whether Jack Doohan can step into that seat if Ocon is to leave and pick up where he's left off because Ocon's an incredibly talented driver, don't get me wrong, he makes some, some silly mistakes sometimes. Other times I think he gets unfairly you know, criticised for actually I think some of those Perez ones back in the uh, racing point, for, no sorry, Force India days should I say, were not his fault at all. I think Perez actually was sometimes more the aggressor, that squeezing Spa and that Singapore one into the wall as well, naughty, naughty Checo. Ocon frustrates me so much because he's got so much talent and I'm just like, bro, it's not Euro F3 anymore. You're not fighting for your life, stop. So he's brewing enough, I mean, just speaking in the moment and getting a bit overzealous and actually he won't be replaced. Well, I would have thought that in the moment, but then Craig Slater on Sky Sports yesterday was talking about how this is actually under serious consideration. And again, for me, there's no way this is being considered if they believe Ocon is a long-term option, right? Because why would you do that? That would be humiliating to Esteban to drop him for that. Like, it's bad, right? He's in the wrong. He's put his hands up that he was in the wrong. But to drop him, that's crazy. But then again, look, the PTSD that they must be feeling at Alpine after losing Piastri, seeing how good Piastri has gone on to be as well. We're thinking Ocon's going to leave anyway. We're thinking Jack Doohan could be the guy to step him. Let's give him a trial run. We saw how well Behrman did when he deputised. We saw how well Lawson did. Very well Lawson did 
when he deputised. Let's do the same with Jack, let's chuck him in. These young drivers can clearly swim when given the opportunity. We've got the data, he seems to tick all the boxes on paper. Maybe he doesn't tick all the boxes on paper, but then why would they be giving him so much testing so consistently if they didn't believe that he's capable enough to at least be a reserve? if not a replacement. The frustration I feel about Esteban right now is, is kind of similar to what I felt about Yuki after Bahrain. Great Grand Prix and he's had a really good start to the season, but when he's chucking his car around on the, the outlap because he's frustrated, I'm like, bro, what are you doing? Like, you're giving Christian excuses to not promote you to Red Bull and you're giving other teams reasons to look at you and be like, I can't trust a thousand staff and all the work that goes in in someone who can't keep a lid on their emotions. And I look at Esteban Ocon and I'm like, you need to understand where that team is and you don't need to be fighting two for now. For every, you, you need to play the team game when you're in this position. I've said the same about Mercedes multiple times. I feel like, you know, I, I think George should give a bit more focus on the team rather than just trying to beat Lewis every single time and just forgetting everything else. Because would it be fair to hoik Esteban Ocon? Absolutely not. But could I understand why Alpine would do it? I absolutely could. They don't know what Esteban wants for the future. It certainly doesn't feel like he wants to be at that team anymore, but Jack Dewan certainly does want to be in that Alpine F1 car. So you're giving Alpine some control there and maybe control is the thing that they've lacked most over these last couple of years after losing you know, Alonso and Piastri. But those are my thoughts on the subject anyway. Let me know yours in the comments below. My name's Tomo. Thanks again. Have a good one. Ta-da.